So I guess this is going to be the, the dessert of, of this, uh, this five-course meal. You've got all your nutritious food in you, uh, all, everything that's going to sustain you. This is the cherry on the top at the end. And it really is because my, my philosophy is very much 30,000 feet uh, above land. I'm not going to get too technical on any of this. You've had very technical talks up until this point. And all the difficult questions are going to be thrown back at the previous speakers. So I encourage a lot of good questions at the end. We've got very good people to answer them. Um, in terms of Namibia as a country, uh, I spent a lot of time coming to Namibia before I moved to the US. We had some cattle projects that we were working on here. Uh, I've never seen it look like it does today. It, it, I, I know what the cure uh, for jet lag is now. It's just driving from Vintuk. Out, out towards Kama, but it cures any jet lag that you might have had. It's looking incredible. And also, in terms of a place to live for uh, just for lifestyle purposes and uh, a place where the world's problems seem to not, not exist, you guys are in a really good place now. And uh, Namibia, Namibia is, uh, will be the envy of the world for the next little while. I think you've managed to escape a lot of the challenges. Yeah. I've, this is the fourth continent I've stood and spoken on in the last six days. So if I get my, my, if I get a little confused, it's because of that. But I honestly mean it. You've got something very special going on here. The, the harmony between the different people groups. And they're not the easiest people groups in the world, I'll tell you that. I know when the questions come, when it's from someone whose ancestors were from the Netherlands or Germany, they're never easy questions. They get to the point pretty quickly. That's why I'm glad I've got a lot of support from the previous speakers when it comes to answering those questions. So my talk today is going to be a global perspective on, on profitable livestock uh, management. And when we discussed a theme on, on what, what we could have for today, I like the balanced approach to doing things because we have a tendency, especially nowadays uh, as a human race, to try and get a solution overnight uh, or, or to push extremes to try and uh, cut corners to get to that solution. And I think what, what uh, in every sphere of life, but especially in livestock production, the balanced approach and slowly moving forward cautiously uh, is, is where the, the true solutions are coming and the sustainable solutions are coming. Um, introduction, I was born and raised in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Uh, on a fifth generation livestock operation. Uh, ancestors came from Ireland in the 1860s and 70s, escaping the potato famine. Being Irish is nice anywhere in the world because you can get away with whatever you want. No one can point fingers at you. Uh, you're innocent when it comes to anything. You, you get away with it all. So that, that's, that's been one benefit. Um, we set up a, a program called Bonhaven Beef Cattle, which was a multi-breed project that I started at a very small scale in high school and then got some partners on, on board later and then developed it through uh, different Southern African countries across different breeds uh, where we ended up running 1,500 uh, registered cattle in very different climatic conditions. And what that showed me immediately was that there isn't a breed that solves everyone's problems all the time in all places. And uh, you've got to find animals that work in different environments, different objectives, uh, cattle that, that suit different resources. And so I think that's going to be the gist of my message today is that the, the idea of a salesman coming and selling a silver bullet that's going to solve everyone's problems, uh, that lie has been revealed now. And uh, we, it's a lot more difficult to solve problems now, but you can actually solve them honestly and truthfully when you take this balanced approach moving forward. Just for context purposes, uh, what I do from a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, activity level, just so that you've got some context of, of why I think like I do or why I'm maybe missing a few blind spots that you might point out later, um, my, my life is pretty much divided in, into, well, not my life, my work life is divided into four bits. I'm the 
international business manager for a company called Transova Genetics. Uh, their main line is making uh, embryos, mainly cattle, but also sheep, goats, and pigs. Make about 450,000 embryos a year, and uh, and they also involved in cloning and gene editing, and uh, they, they have a small AI department. Um, so that's that's one quarter of what I do. Then there's a, a, a commodity trading company I work with in Dallas, where I'm over there beef and live cattle sales, uh, and all for export. So I've, I've had a, that's broadened my horizons a bit when it comes to the end product. Uh, I've got a, a, a par two partners. We've got a Wagyu marketing company where we do two Wagyu sales uh, a month in the US. That's been interesting because that's taken me into a different direction as well. And then my core business, Global Livestock Solutions, is consulting with cattle producers around the world uh, in various different shapes and forms. Um, and that, in the last 10 years, has kept me moving. I, I've been to 95 countries and 48 US states, uh, just anything to do with cows, bulls, and airplanes. Um, these are just some pictures from around the world, judging up in Norway and Uruguay at the top. Uh, this is an Angus beef project I'm working on in Romania, uh, which is a full value chain uh, from uh, the, the, the consumer in Germany and Switzerland, working all the way back uh, to the seed stock producers in Romania. Bottom right is also in Uruguay, judging a show there. Top left was in Honduras, judging a national Brahmin show, and then that's a Charolais car up in Canada. Bottom right is a Charolais in Colombia. You'll see very different body types and livestock types as we move through, uh, stressing the point that there is no animal or breed that works in the environment. This was down in Finland, the Hereford show down there. This was the first ever international job that I, I got for consulting. It was back in 2009. Um, it was in the Seychelles, a very nice place to start, it, it, all backwards from there. And uh, the guy who hired me was the the current Minister of Foreign Affairs, a guy called uh, Patrick Pillay, and he had the largest cattle operation in Seychelles, and he needed me to go consult with him for seven days. So I enthusiastically got there, and on the first afternoon, we looked through uh, his herd of 21 cows, and that took about an hour of really looking at those cows, and then I realized I had six and a half days uh, to lie on the beach. But what that taught me was that... Um, we, when working with, with producers in every single, uh, w whether it's 20 cows or 20,000 cows, you have to listen before you talk, because this guy taught me very good lessons that day. Uh, he had all his cattle on this beautiful green pasture overlooking the Indian Ocean, and uh, at night he'd bring them into stables, and he'd say to me, and, and I said to him, why are you doing this? Each cow into an individual stable with a concrete floor, and he'd feed them in there, and I said, this is a waste of manpower. The cows prefer being out in the pasture. You know, is this a tradition that I'm not aware of? But you, you really could stop, you could stop doing that. And he said, what do you think we make our money out of? So I said, well, they're beef cows, so I'm assuming out of beef. And he said, no, our major profit driver is the hotels and the resorts. Uh, they come and harvest the manure off the concrete every morning and they use that for their vegetable gardens and, their, and, and for their flower gardens. And that's firstly where we make our money. And then secondly, uh, the, the cattle on the islands and the Seychelles are used as beasts of burden. So for pulling carts, some of the islands you can't uh, drive uh, motor vehicles, so they pull carts. This bull down here is crushing coconuts. So that's, they use them as beasts of burden. And then they also milk these cattle. So there's, there's some value from a subsistence level out of milking these cattle. And then once those cows are dung, uh, uh, done produce, uh, producing dung and milk and being beasts of burden, then they harvest them for slaughter at the end. So I said, OK, keep putting them in those concrete stables. But I learned a very good lesson there. And it's become a really nice relationship, which has opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, we saw some boron heifers for him in Kenya, and we've done a few of these shipments um, where the, uh, the, uh, the, in the Seychelles they found that the boron really works well and is adapted to most of their needs. Um, and we sourced these cattle at Old Pegeta in, uh, 
in Kenya, just in, uh, at the foot of Mount Kenya in, in Nanyuki. And that was also, that door led to me uh, being exposed to, to this breed of cattle, which I'd seen in numerous uh, herds in large numbers in South Africa, but I'd never seen them used as they were purposed to be used. And that is as an animal that's adapted to those uh, equatorial conditions, some of it at high altitude, cattle that are calving at a very young age, they come into estrus at a young age, cattle with uh, perfect feet, really good udders, nice temperament, good herd instinct, uh, and suited to their environment. You know, they're playing a home game every day. And we know w when you watch sports, I was in India for the last 10 days last week, and now I know why you don't go and win cricket matches in India. It's impossible. The food, the heat, the people, the cows, it's just chaos. You can't do it. And that's why the, it's so important that we use cattle and use home ground advantage to them. Don't try and make an animal that's not suited to your environment go and, and think you're going to win when it's playing an away game. Um, so I'll, I'll get into some of the why I focused on, on that uh, old Pejita Boran story as well as, as I did later, or as much as I did later. But uh, what they showed me too is that you, that was a 1,100 year process of cattle that didn't have good feet would get eaten by cats. Or cattle with bad udders, the calf couldn't get up and nurse, so a hyena might take it. The wild ones broke away from, from the herd and exposed themselves to cats. And a lot of the reasons why those Boran were, were as complete as they were, as we've seen them, in Kenya and places that run cattle in, in similar ways was because nature had forced them to be like that. I remember speaking to the, the manager at Olpegeta the second time I went there and I said, what is your breeding philosophy? What tools are you using? Like who's analyzing your data? And he said, basically, when the cattle all come in to be worked, the ones that don't look like the others get kicked out. I mean, that was a simple formula and, and it worked. And if you think about it, he was, he was certainly onto something there. We might have complicated this a little bit more than we needed to. I remember uh, reading Tom Lasseter's book, the founder of the Beef Master Breed, and his takeaway uh, message for me was that cattle breeding is simple, uh, and the difficult part is keeping it simple. So maybe, maybe these guys are onto something between Olpegeta and Lasseter. This is just to keep things in context for me and for everyone here. Going back to the silver bullet, Basically, that image on the right represents a Roman or Egyptian or Phoenician city uh, where when those empires were strong, the way they would build cities is the emperor or the king is right up in the middle, and then all around the city they've got gates facing north, south, east, and west, and uh, larger cities would have eight gates, uh, which is the example I'm going to use here. And the purpose for that was that every gate that have a gatekeeper and that gatekeeper, along with all the others, once a week or once a month, or whatever the emperor needed uh, that information, would all come to the emperor and would explain to, to him uh, or her what the world looked like from their gate. So the guy who's watching from the north gate can tell him this is what the world looks like to the north, and the same with the east and the south and the west and all other directions. So the emperor knew what the world looked like by using eight different gatekeepers. Now, in uh, animal agriculture, especially cattle farmers, that's a lot like our farm. We also, kings or emperors, sitting in the middle of our farm. A lot of us are also self-proclaimed philosophers and scientists. You can just ask anyone in this room. And the, those eight gates, for me, the way I break it down are genetics, animal management or herd management, nutrition, uh, management, uh, sorry, not management, marketing, uh, record keeping, forage management or soil management, and then human capital or human resources, uh, and then animal health I didn't mention. So those eight gates are all equally important. And if you ignore any of them, it opens a gate for villains to come in, profit to go out, and when you're not managing a gate, a whole city can collapse just from that one gate not being there. The reason I like telling the story is because my speciality is really only in one of those gates. And often when we sell that silver bullet, we, like if you've got an animal health guy who's got this new vaccine, 
he promises you the world if you use his vaccine. And the nutrition guys are the same. And any one of those divisions, you know, the, 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 the semen salesmen, they come and they say, you use this bull, it's golden after that. You're going to live a different life. And it's not, it's not really a true story. This is incremental growth slowly using, using every division up to its maximum and then slowly moving it forward. And uh, it makes us feel very small because you realize how little uh, you're actually contributing, one-eighth to this. But also, there's comfort in it because you realize that you're living in an ecosystem that, that, that you'll have support for those genetics from the animal health guys, from the marketing guys, from the soil and pasture managers, etc. The other uh, example I like is, is this wheel with eight spokes. I mean, you, you drive a, a wagon or a, or a bicycle with eight spokes. If, if one spoke is longer than the other, meaning if you pay more attention to one of those divisions than the other, it's not, it's not a comfortable ride, okay? It only, it's only comfortable and only really goes forward if all eight spokes are, are used equally at the same length. And uh, if, if one or two of them are missing or longer or shorter than the others, you're going to get a flat tire pretty soon and then the whole engine or vehicle just doesn't move forward anymore. So just now we've realized that that we only one eighth of the equation, no matter what discipline you're working at, and that if you are a farmer or a producer, you need to pay attention to all of, all of those eight. Uh, to make ourselves feel a little bit smaller, if you take genetics, which is where I, my sweet spot is, uh, you probably divide that four ways again with exactly the same principles on, on, on what emphasis to put on cattle when you're selecting them. So one of them would be, uh, EPDs, EBVs, or uh, genomically enhanced EPDs or EBVs, so there's one quarter. Uh, one of them would be phenotype, which we'll go into later. One would be pedigree, which a lot of people have forgotten about. Um, a lot of cattle breeders realize the value of cow families and knowing what pedigree lines work well. Cattle with very similar phenotypes and EPDs, but different pedigrees work differently depending on what your objectives are. And then the fourth one is in-herd data capture, wanting to know what the actual data or pheno phenotype data was for that specific herd. And the reason for that is when you buy into a program, and uh, if I may, I'll use Kamab as an example. If you use Simbra bulls from Kamab, then you know what their management practices are, you know what their environment is, you know uh, basically how they, they fill those eight bases when they pay attention to building their, their operation. So the data they capture within that environment, with, within, the, within the resources they've got, actually means something to you. Whereas if you ignore the actual in-herd numbers that are captured within that herd and the ratios uh, within that herd, you, you're utilizing data only that's, you know, that, that might be way out of uh, the type of environment that, that you work in yourself. Um, okay, so then you take, let's say, for example, I'm, I'm working on, uh, on one of those divisions, and let's call it phenotype. I think it's very important, again, that, that we realize where profit comes from in a livestock, especially today we're talking about beef cattle in a beef cattle system. And this, this is where the marketers have a field day, because it's very easy to market the, the, the shiny object in the room, you know, the sexy traits like growth, muscle, milk, marbling. But those aren't the profit-driving traits, and it was so good hearing Colin talk about this too. The profit-driving traits are fertility, longevity, adaptability, and efficiency. And if you don't have an adaptable animal, it doesn't matter what it's capable of doing on, on paper. It has to be adapted to your environment first. And the same with fertility. If, if, if your factory is not producing, it doesn't matter what your factory looks like. It's completely irrelevant. Longevity, you need it around for a long time uh, so that you, you don't have to have this high replacement rate where you keep replacing uh, your, your factory being your car. And efficiency too, and not just feed efficiency, but effic car calf efficiency, efficiency of movement, just all the efficiencies that make that bovine actually function. So I think when analyzing cattle from any one of those four aspects, when it, whether it's from phenotype or from EPDs or in-herd data, 
or from pedigree, is to remember that those four traits at the top are the ones that are actually going to make you profit. These are what I call turnover traits. That's what keeps the, the, the money rolling once those profit traits are, are set in. So we, we've seen this in a lot of different numbers and expressed in different ways, but fertility is incredibly important. And it's, for today's example, I'm going to say it's 10 times more important than growth. Obviously, various different situations will come up with different numbers. So we've got to make these cows productive and, and fertile. For cardless transactions, in a heartbeat, it's time to discover PayPulse. With PayPulse, you can use your phone to pay anyone in Namibia for anything at any time. Send money to friends, family, whoever you like, even if they don't have the PayPulse app. Top up your prepaid airtime and load up more electricity. Want to pay your bills without leaving the couch? PayPulse has got you covered. How about depositing or withdrawing cash, paying at the shops, or settling the bill at a restaurant? Yep, with PayPulse, you can do it all. Once you have the app, you can link any card from any bank and enjoy unbeatable security through every step of registration and payment. Fast, secure, and easy to use. It's the most convenient way to pay. To get your finger on the pulse, visit paypulse.na. Longevity is incredibly important too because like any business or any factory, the longer it stays around and the more years you, you, you can create a calf out of it. If you're in dairy, the more lactations you get out of a cow. Uh, if, you, if you have a factory producing some other commodity, the longer it stays standing, uh, the more profitable you are. Adaptability, this is where I think a lot of modern day cattle producers are getting it wrong at levels higher than anywhere else in the past. Is we taking animals and trying to change the environment to suit the animal, which is the most unprofitable way to do business. We've got to find animals that are adapted to the climate and then make them good once they are. So like that Nelor cow and calf and the, those Nelor cows in Brazil, there are areas in Brazil where that's the only breed that's going to work. You know, even, even the more modern Bosendicus breeds like Brahmin don't really work in that environment. They cross Brahmin bulls onto those Nelor as a, a, as a cross because the Nelor cow is the only one that can actually work there. And there's a Scottish Highland cow which if she was in Namibia today, we, we'd say she's soft and she's not hardy, but she is in her environment. You take her up into the highlands of Scotland or into parts of Canada or Scandinavia, there isn't a more hardy animal. So it's, again, it's, it's making these animals play home games and, and as few uh, away games as possible. And then efficiency, like I spoke about before, I know Brad went into this with feed efficiency, cow-calf efficiency, getting those cows to wean, depending on your environment and your system, you know, 45% of, of the mother's body weight, 50%, make it creep up a, a bit as you put selection pressure on your cattle. They've, they've got to be efficient, uh, otherwise we're losing, we're losing profit. Um, so now when we get on to our, our shiny ball traits, this is where balance becomes so, so important. I think when you're looking at your profit traits, I mean, fertility, there's, the, the, the balance with fertility is making them as fertile as you can get them. Same with adaptability, getting them as adapted as you can, making them as efficient as you can, and then getting those cattle to live as, as, as long as they can without having too much of a weight before getting them into production. But where the balance really comes in is in our turnover traits. So with growth, you've got this big Kianina bull on the left, and you've got that miniature Galloway calf on the right. And I'd say you're probably going to land somewhere right in the middle of those two to get a, a balanced product. And the reason why you, you don't want to go extreme in either way is because growth is such an antag antagonistic trait to traits like fertility, uh, traits like milk production, uh, and certainly uh, traits like efficiency and adaptability. Muscle's the same. We've got these Belgian blue bulls in Belgium on the right and the Wagyu cow on the, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean on my left and the Wagyu cow on the right. For most people in most environments and most markets, uh, I'm not talking about niche markets now, but like actual commodity markets, we probably need to be slap bang in the middle of those two in terms of how much muscle depth and expression uh, we put on these cattle. 
Milk, there again, uh, it seems like I'm picking on the Belgian blue guys. So I'm sorry if there are any producers here today. They've got, a, they've got a place, but they work really nicely on the slideshow because they are very extreme. Um, <laughs> the, on the right, we've got a Holstein car. On the left, uh, a Belgian blue car. And again, for most environments, we probably need to be slap bang in the middle because, again, too much milk can be antagonistic to fertility and adaptability, and too little milk doesn't, doesn't get you a token at the end of the, breed, uh, of the production season. Marbling, um, same story. I'm just going to keep singing the same song, different verse, all day long. I'm one-dimensional, okay? There, there, there are certain markets that are going to uh, really, really reward you for, for having that high marbling, and it's niche markets, it's a luxury product, uh, it, but it, it'll never be commoditized because these cattle aren't efficient enough to, to be able to go to the masses. And on the right, there's a product there that's pure protein, but you, you need a pretty sharp knife to cut through that. So we probably need to be slap bang in the middle uh, with, with those two as well. Um, this is a question I get asked everywhere I go, is, is what size must a cow be? Like what is the perfect size? And this is a metric I've come up with. Now, these aren't exact numbers, but, but it's just, I think it's important to have numbers to work with. And the, my philosophy is once we go through all these steps, whatever size your cows are, once you've gone through these, that is the exact right size uh, for your farm. So firstly, appropriate nutrition and management, so you don't spoil them and you don't starve them. Just treat them like the good commercial farmers are treating them in your area. Um, this I use uh, for most of my American talks, carve them by 27 months. Now I understand in a lot of environments in Southern Africa and other parts of the world, you're only going to carve at three years old. So turn that 27 into 39 and work it into a metric. There will be places in Southern Africa that you can carve by 27 months. Use that as a metric. I'm not sticking to any of these exact numbers. I'm just saying you need to have a number. Um, have these cattle conceive in a 90-day breeding season? As you move forward, we've taken some clients down to 60 days. Also, it's a lot of it's got to do with your environment, pasture size, the types of breeds that you're working with. And do this annually and on time. So have a breeding season where these cows have to carve at the same time every year. And, uh, and this is where Tom Lasseter put it so well too, that when those cows and calves come in at the end, at, at weaning time, that cow gives you something to market. She either gives you a calf or she gives you herself. So there's no car that's going to get away with, with being a, a free rider or a passenger. And then establish a mini minimum weight at seven months or whatever age you wean, depending on what country you're in, for your climate. So let's say, for example, for your market, thumb suck, say it's for your farm, it's 220 kilos, or it's 200 kilos, or 260, whatever it is. Just say for that season, that's the minimum. And if, if that calf doesn't reach that, amount then mommy goes to town uh, with the calf and that way you're making sure that your cows don't get too small because they're bringing you in that that minimum weaned calf weight and then the calf must be at least 45 percent of the cow's weight at that seven month period uh, as we get our cows more efficient you can push it up to 50 and beyond what that does is it stops the cows from getting too big because next week i'm judging a national show in Ireland and there will be some 1,000 kg cows there and they are not going to wean 500 kg weaners they, so they're just not efficient okay so you do this every year and within four to five years your cows will be the right size for your environment resources and objectives so you just keep doing this and then whatever cows are left at the end uh, is the right size so no one can tell you if your cows are too big or too small I realize I'm preaching to the choir because I know this is a lot of the philosophy that, that, that is used um, in Namibia. Um, so evaluating structure and phenotype, uh, this is definitely my sweet spot. I believe that the phenotype of an animal tells you a lot about it. Uh, but I use those same philosophies when we look at these cattle. So firstly, they need to be able to eat, walk, and reproduce. So good jaws, really good feet and legs and good sexual organs and secondary sexual traits. Uh, and then, again, like I've said, focus on the foremost important economic traits, fertility, longevity, efficiency, adaptability, 
And then once you've laid that foundation, then you can build growth and marbling and, uh, and milk and muscle onto that. And then uh, this is something that I, I, I like saying because I believe it. Um, quality cattle come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. It's very easy to make little ones and big ones and black ones and red ones and horned ones and polled ones. Uh, the art of breeding lies in making good ones. And then when you decide or I decide what a good one is, then it's up to the market to decide whether that good one fits their objectives, their resources, and of course their environment. This is a soapbox for me, and I think that this is where I've probably had the most pushback from Southern African colleagues is, is on the, the fat topic. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it, is it, is it ugly? There's a saying in Afrikaans uh, that uh, uh, animal is clip art, you know, and that's a positive thing, apparently. Um, so what we found with those cattle where they made them really hard-muscled, they tightened up their middles, they tightened their hides, they lost some bone. Because of that, they lost testicle size and fertility. Those really hard cattle which were eye-appealing, remember, eye-appeal is very subjective, so that looked good. One man's treasure is another man's trash. So what we lost from that is we lost fertility, uh, we lost foraging ability from those cows because uh, they needed some higher energy to maintain that body type. Uh, we, we lost age at, at first uh, estrus or, or puberty for the bulls. We lost our good temperaments in those cattle because leaner cattle are wilder than, than, than uh, softer or easier fleshing cattle. And then we, we made a worse eating experience because we took the, the flavor out of the, the end product. Again, this is obviously a balance, but I think it's very important that in maternal cattle and in environments like Namibia, most of us will be producing mater maternal cows that go and produce wean calves. Fat is energy, and we have to maintain a balance between fat and muscle in order to have good balanced cattle, because if we suck all the fat out of our maternal cattle, we're left with like that big Belgian blue cow that had no milk. So we're looking for balance. We're just looking for animals and for me, balance is, again, a subjective term. Uh, for me, what it means is it's a skeletal balance, so all the body parts fit together harmoniously in the right proportions. It's a balance between true muscle shape and tone and fat cover, so you balance that together. Um, and then it's, it's a hormonal balance, so you want your bulls to look like bulls that must be masculine with good testicles and uh, bulls that have... have are muscled in the right proportion, and your females must be ladylike. You want them with faces like princesses and butts like cooks. You know. <laughs> Going a little higher altitude, looking at our industry from a 30,000 foot level, we're in a very sweet spot because the pressure that's been put on us from the elite urban areas around the world is uh, we have to be sustainable for good reason, uh, and animals need to be produced humanely. What we've got with cattle, sheep, and goats is we blend those two things together really well. We can produce our cattle uh, humanely out on pasture in, in natural environment for most of the year, but also uh, it, it, you know, it's humane, but it's also sustainable. We can keep doing it year after year if we maintain those eight uh, different bases and we keep loading those bases so we keep doing that. Um, I've got a white-tailed deer here, but here it would be a chemspok or a kudu. It's very humane. Incredible. You can't get more humane than that. But we're not going to feed 7.5 billion people with, with kudu backstraps. It's not going to happen. We, there's just not enough productivity out of those animals. We could feed them out of chickens and pigs, though, because that's very sustainable. Uh, I think the last animals to ever die out will be chickens because everyone eats them, and they, they rely on us 100% uh, for their survival, and they've become a, an immediate source of, uh, of protein for us. But the humane question gets raised with them because of the way they're raised in, in factory farm scenarios. And I'm, I'm speaking as the devil's advocate. I've, I've got no issue. I eat as much chicken as the next guy because we all need our vegetables. But the, 
the, the, this is becoming an issue for the elite urban centers around the world on how chickens are raised. So we, we can market, we're in that sweet spot of being humane and sustainable. Uh, just some interesting numbers. So China, this was a few years back, I, I was giving a talk in Paraguay, and at that point the average Paraguayan family was, uh, was budgeting half a kilogram of beef per person for their dinner parties and functions, including women and children. And at that same time, China was eating three kilograms of beef per person per year, okay? But the growth projection over the next five years was to double that to six kgs per person per year. And to fill that gap between the three kgs to six kgs was gonna take an industry the size of Brazil, which is 220 million cattle, to fill that, a new one which obviously you can't just produce another Brazilian cattle industry. So, um, simple mathematics from 30,000 feet, that's less supply, more demand, prices are gonna go up for most people in most places um, over the next few years. That's very good news for us. Um, the US, getting back onto the efficiency thing, we're seeing less, our cattle numbers have, have uh, plateaued, we're not going to have any more cows because the, the land is fully developed, so now we're needing to produce that beef and milk with the same amount or fewer cows, which is driving up uh, efficiencies, and there's several different ways in which they're doing that. So the, the US, if you put the US and Canada as, as, as one market, which it really has become, uh, you're only looking at about 105 million uh, cattle but we're producing significantly more beef than Brazil does with double the amount of cattle. And that's just efficiencies and, and management uh, practices. And also some part of that is environment as well and work ethic. <laughs> um, challenges. So my grandfather always taught me there are three things you never talk about in public. So we're in public now. The one of them is uh, politics. Uh, you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about sex. So we're not going to talk about sex because that's very boring, but we are going to talk about religion and politics because it actually does come into uh, the way in which we raise cattle worldwide. These miniature calves on the left, uh, I'm getting an increasing amount of demand from countries like Norway for miniature cattle. The reason is they get subsidized for those cattle the same way as they would a full-grown animal, and because of that, they can run double to triple the amount of cows. Subsidies create very false markets, and it's, it's very appealing because it's money for nothing, but it can destroy an industry. On the right, we've got the other extreme. Now, that's in Belgium with quotas. Somehow, I've got those three bulls in, in the slide again. I apologize for that. But those Belgian blue bulls, because in Belgium, they're quoted to having a set amount of animals per producer depending on their land size. So if you're only allowed to have 18 cows, you're gonna have the biggest 18 cows you can possibly have. And that causes all kinds of trouble whether it comes to calving and, and uh, any other issues that, that goes with that subfertility. So quotas and subsidies produce false markets. The reward for a lifetime of dedication goes beyond money and the expectations of others. We aim to serve our community and actively participate in the development of our industry. Agra, a better life. That top, that was a Brahmin bull I judged in Cuba a few years back. Um, they used to welcome me there when I was a South African citizen and then they haven't welcomed me back since I became an American citizen. So. Anyway, that was a, my champion Brahmin bull, and as you can see, not the best you've ever seen, but certainly not the worst you've ever seen. That bull sold for $400 the day after the show, and uh, I said to the guy, you can't sell a bull like that for $400, and he said, look, the average person's making $25 a month uh, for his salary, and uh, it's all owned by the government anyway. We're just s sending money from one government division to the next. Communism really creates bad cattle because there's no incentive to improve them. And what we found is Cuba's just become a multiplier of cattle. The, the, the breeding incentive has been taken out of it completely. This is the Pampas in Argentina, one of the most amazing places to raise cattle in the world. Heard of Hereford cows coming to water. Uh, Argentina had a little flirt with socialism in the early 2000s 
And uh, the president then, uh, Christina Kirshner, made beef exports illegal, or she kept 5% of beef exports open for all her cronies. And the goal was to make beef cheap for the people in Argentina, okay? Noble goal, very generous lady. But the, the people in the Pampas, like us uh, farmers and, and, and uh, animal producers, are very smart. They weren't going to produce beef on some of the best land in the world if it was going to be sold cheap. So they moved all their cows off the, off the Pampas and planted soybeans to sell to China. And Argentina went from 60 million cattle to 50 million cattle in about six years, which meant that beef for the people in Argentina became more expensive than, than ever before. The social engineering and, and playing with socialism also makes very bad cattle and bad decisions. Wars and political unrest, this is in South Sudan. This picture actually works here. The, their cattlemen and cowboys are actually very similar to the Texas and Namibian farmers. They like guns and they like cows. But the Texas and Namibian farmers probably shouldn't take their shirts off in public. They're not quite as built as the South Sudanese uh, Dinka herdsmen. But because of this, it makes it very difficult for these guys to produce good cattle because they're always looking behind their shoulder on when, when the next bit of unrest is going to come, who's going to take their cattle, who's coming to pillage uh, their herds. So we've seen the same thing now, more recently with Russia and Ukraine, where animal productivity in the Ukraine has almost shut down. There are few semen companies around the world who are finding ways to get semen into those places, especially the dairies, to keep them productive. But it's very difficult for Ukraine, which is a massive agriculture country, to actually move forward because of the madness that's going on there now. Um, EPDs and genomics, this is a, a picture I took in Kazakhstan. A guy called Dorian Garrick from New Zealand was talking. And this is a, an example again about balance. And what we saw in the last few years, well not few years, maybe 10, 15 years, was this drive to selecting cattle uh, off, off paper. Now I've given them their credit, uh, I've given them as much credit as phenotype. Remember I, I mentioned four ways to, to select for balanced cattle. I said you look at EPDs and, uh, or genomically enhanced EPDs or EPVs, you look at inherit data, you look at pedigree, and then you look at phenotypes. So I've given them their credit, right? Okay, now it's time for a blood nose. This, these EPDs and genomics work so well as a tool and a very valuable tool if everyone is measuring everything honestly, accurately, and in large numbers. It even works if most people are measuring most things almost accurately, almost honestly, and in medium-sized numbers. The problem we have today, is, and this is a problem in beef in Western countries more than anywhere else, is not everyone's measuring. So there's a lot of assumptions based on, on relatives and ancestors of those animals that they accredit these animals to, to have the ability to be different to something else in their contemporary group, even though maybe for two, three, four, five generations, there's been no data submitted on those animals. Th this formula, uh, it, this is a Rolls Royce if used correctly. Like I believe in it, genomically enhanced EPDs. Unfortunately, what we're very good at in North America, Australia, New Zealand, and I see South Africa is getting good at this too, is uh, the marketers, they'll take a number, and it might be the highest weaning weight EPD or EBV or the highest, uh, or the highest uh, yearling weight EPD, and they think uh, that's something to go to town with. Now we're gonna market that thing. And, uh, and what that does is the whole deal comes undone because what you've done is you've taken a Rolls Royce and you've put a driver in that at best doesn't have a license and in most cases is intoxicated. A lot of the guys driving this don't understand it, and I think that's where it's the duty of guys in genetics companies like Brad and myself. Some of the leading guys in this field are actually in Namibia. I mean, I haven't met Maggie Schneider before, but I've been reading about you for years. These are guys who measure, that actually do the measuring. The data input is good, so the output is going to be good. My caution sticker on this Rolls Royce is it's only, it, you can only call it a Rolls Royce if you know who's putting the data in and what data is going into that, that Rolls Royce. Um, another 
example here of taking those big number EPDs or EBVs instead of finding a balanced approach to what weaning weight or what milk number, what birth weight number works for your objectives and your environment is when this is, this, what this graph is showing is between 1970, no sorry, 1980 and 2017, this was based on Angus cattle, the average Angus steer in a feedlot in America was making $140 more over that time, taking into consideration labor costs, inflation, feed costs, everything. That's amazing if you own a feedlot. Every steer is making $140 more. And that was based solely on focusing on growth and carcass uh, on those cattle. During that same time, the red line, it was costing $134 per year more per cow to run them in the US because they got bigger and more terminal. So please, if we're going to play this game with EPDs and genomics, make sure your drivers have got licenses and that they haven't had anything to drink. Because otherwise, you're going to have a situation where the cow-calf producers are losing and the feedlots are winning. And that's, that's not good for the, for the beef cattle ecosystem. On the right is something that I hope you'll never see in Namibia. That's a show steer in, in the US. This has become a big sport in recreation, and it is amazing. Like These kids are taught how to work animals. Uh, there's a lot of money involved, a lot of competition involved, but unfortunately a lot of them when they leave uh, those junior programs, they forget that it was just a sport and recreation they were playing and they try and take some of that into the real world in, in the beef industry. So fortunately that doesn't really apply in Namibia, but I'm just showing you what a fluffy cow looks like. <laughs> this is another... Uh, so I'm going up 60,000 feet now, but this is another thing that's very important for us. We're not in this alone. In, in growing food around the world and feeding 7.5 billion people and making them flourish, uh, we, we've got allies and we have to link shields with a lot of these uh, different groups. This is a, a map of the world uh, showing all the deaths from GMO consumption over the last 30 years. And it's not it's not a black and white map, it's a color map. And you can see so far we had zero. And yet the production of GMOs is so demonized around the world uh, for who knows what reason, except for maybe some political gain and, and some ulterior motives. But their countries, I was in India, like I said, the last 10 days, and their millies, their corn is about this high. And it, GMO corn there would make those 1.4 billion people flourish. Because firstly, they're competing with that corn with cows that they can't eat. And secondly, the corn they're growing can't adapt to the Indian conditions. A GMO product could actually feed that nation like yellow rice in China with added vitamin B in it allowed the Chinese people to flourish. So, let me put it out there. As an ally in what we do in feeding the world, maybe calling GMOs, uh, well, banning GMOs or not allowing them into a country uh, like our neighbor to your east and our north, President Mugabe did, uh, is maybe, it's maybe as uh, immoral a thing as you could do when it comes to, to making people flourish. He has another, another very strong ally we have in this industry, and that's fossil fuels. And the reason I say that is we in the business of producing food. And the way we produce food at mass scale around the world is with energy. And the most affordable, plentiful, reliable energy there is today is fossil fuels. So you demonize fossil fuels, you demonize the fuel or the food of food, and it makes it more difficult to, to feed, uh, feed 7.5 billion people and growing. A lot of these problems, thank the Pope in Rome, isn't a Namibian issue. But we are living because you guys have got a, a country that can do it without GMOs and you can do it without uh, fossil fuels to a, to a large extent. But that global village ecosystem is coming into play. You guys feed into it and you feed from it. This is also interesting. That's a feedlot uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, and this is Los Angeles. But for the sake of today, let's call that Manhattan, New York, similar principle. So these people are telling those people that it's inhumane to keep cattle like that because they're in small spaces. They're not grazing and foraging on green grass for those last four months, three, to, three and a half to four months of their lives. Uh, they're eating TMRs, so it's not 
like a natural product they're eating, um, and but those, those and that, that TMR is very well balanced with minerals and vitamins for them. They've got clean water whenever they need it. They've got shade when it's too hot, shelter when it's too cold. They've got on-call vet, uh, veterinarians the whole time. And then on this side, we've got people that choose to live in a feedlot. They all live on top of each other. None of them are hunting and gathering and eating, uh, picking nuts and, 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 and shooting animals. They're all eating pizza from the, the TMR from the, the shop store on the corner. Um, they've also cool, they cool when it's uh, hot and they're sheltered when it's cold. These same people have got their, their doctor on call. So it's amazing how these people in the feedlot don't want those cattle to live in a feedlot. It's, a, it's amazing. What we have found, though, is that is one piece of the puzzle in what is making uh, U.S. agriculture and Southern African agriculture so efficient is, is compressing that growth period for a lot of the cattle's population into that short amount of time. Now, if you've got grass pasture and grassland to finish cattle uh, off grass, you're going to be rewarded for it, for sure, because there's a premium on that. But for a lot of the producers that don't, that is a solution. Um, okay, religion and politics. That is uh, your neighbors straight to your south and east, South Africa, my motherland. And what I have to explain to people in Europe and North America that this isn't a prison, this is a farmhouse. And the reason why it's like that is because of a lot of dangerous political unrest that's happened uh, in, in the country. That also makes it very difficult to produce food. On the right where I was last week in India, 330 million cattle and they can't eat beef except for two small states, Kerala in the southwest where all the Catholics live, and then in uh, West Bengal, uh, East Bengal, sorry, up in the, uh, in near Kolkata where there are a lot of Muslims and, and, and uh, Catholics as well. They can eat beef, no one else can. So what happens is when your cows stop producing milk, they just turn them loose and they become stray cows. The male calves just roam the streets and eat food that should be had uh, for, for human consumption. The, the Hindu nationalist government that's running India has maintained this ban on, on beef production. So it is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. They've created the largest export market in the world into Bangladesh, so a lot of these bulls slip under the radar into, into Bangladesh, which is helping purge the country of, of stray and, and, and beef cattle. So every challenge creates an, an opportunity. It's not legal, but it's very uh, widely tolerated. This is a ship from Brazil that takes live cattle uh, to Saudi Arabia and other Middle East countries. So for Eid at the end of Ramadan, when they have their big feasts, they need live cattle to slaughter and live sheep and goats to slaughter. Obviously, from a logit logistical standpoint, it would be a lot better just to send uh, carcasses or cuts there you'd save a lot of money and energy and it'd be a lot more humane for the animals but for religious purposes they want them live so the solution with opportunities is some ships carry up to 25,000 cattle there's ships from Australia that are almost up to 100,000 sheep uh, that take these animals from their source to the to the market so religion and politics creates issues but there are solutions and there are opportunities from uh, all of these situations uh, we have two challenges coming our way now. The one is the lab-grown beef, which um, they, they're using cell lines to produce uh, an animal protein, which is essentially exactly what we eat and consume as beef, growing it in labs as uh, an alternative to, to actually slaughtering animals. I think at the moment they're about at $20,000 a pound or $40,000 a kilogram. So my friends can't afford that. Yours might, but not yet. The other issue with that is these are the same people that don't want us to eat GMO corn. So I, it, it, it absolutely blows my mind how they, they work. But I think they're going to have a challenge with this too because the middle class economies around the world, as they grow, they want to eat and consume better protein and red meat like they saw the affluent uh, people do. And whether that's China or Central and South America, uh, Central and Southern Africa, you're not going to easily get those people to eat lab-grown beef after generations of aspiring to move into that bracket. Um, this is the, the, 
the uh, Impossible Burger. So that's a burger that's made all out of vegetables and chemicals and uh, all kinds of uh, artificial flavors. And that's going to, they say, compete with, with a beef burger. The issue with it is it's not very healthy because the amount of sodium and other chemicals they've had to put in there to get the flavor that, that is produced naturally by animal fat uh, has made it extremely unhealthy. And the other lie that gets told by these people um, that are trying to, to suppress animal agriculture is, uh, is that we're evil because we kill animals. The science is art, and a vegan, a strictly vegan or vegetarian diet kills a hundredfold more animals than a carn carnivore mixed diet because the plow and the disc and monoculture agriculture monocrop agriculture, you're killing every organism, every small animal, every bird in sight when you do that. Where we, in that sweet spot in, uh, in extensive rangeland agriculture, where, where we want the birds, you know, we want the microorganisms, we want the bugs, we want the slugs, we want the snakes, um, you know, we want the, the meerkats and the ground squirrels and, and all that. Where monocrop agriculture kills all of that to pop up the soybeans that they use for tofu, as they and they, they they think they're solving the planet that way. Um, this is another interesting. I get called because we in agriculture we, we we get called climate change deniers for some reason. I've never met anyone who doesn't believe the climate's changing, um, and I think we need to be serious about this because there there are ways in which animal agriculture can contribute in a very positive way. Uh, into getting especially micro environments back to uh, to a, a more sustainable level, but this conversation for me, where I've got to with it is when someone throws that at me because they believe that you know cattle are causing the climate to change and we're all going to die. So what what I say with that is that just get them to be a little bit more specific. You know, if someone asks me if I played sport at university. And I say, yes, what does that mean? I mean, I could have been a bare knuckle boxer or could have played bowls. Get them specific, because as soon as you narrow it down to what they actually mean by that, you can have a healthy conversation, and then you can explain to them that through animal agriculture and utilizing the world's grasslands, there's a graph coming up soon now, a map, which covers a large portion of the world. We can actually improve those microclimates and microenvironments uh, for a positive way, using herbivores and ruminants uh, to do that. He has this map. Um, Colin, you'll know better. What, what percentage of the world's uh, land mass is, is, is rangeland or pasture land? It's like 60%, isn't it? Something like that. Okay. So let's take 40 on the low end, 60 on the high end. Um, depending on how you, you, you manage it, Colin's going to have a, th a fourth alternative to what I'm going to say now, I'm sure. That's why we've got him here. But there are only three things that you can do with this land. One, you can leave it and let it rot. And that's terrible for everyone involved. I mean, those grasses are just going to rot and emit uh, gases into the atmosphere. The second thing is you can burn it uh, just for the sake of making it not rot, and that's also awful because you're emitting carbon dioxide. Or you can take a ruminant and graze it, and they are going to belch out some methane, and that's going to go back into, uh, into the ground, and it's, you know the, the cycle of life that's happened for millions of years is going to continue. But you also get this incredibly good protein that, uh, that these cows and sheep and goats produce uh, from a low-protein source that can nourish and allow these millions and millions of people, billions of people to flourish. So for me, the third alternative uh, is, is certainly the best. Is there a fourth alternative, Colin? To golf. You could build golf courses. But, that, but again, that, that's also not, I think that's, wor that, that's the worst of all four of them. They call it a, a good walk spoiled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I say we graze it. I say we graze it, and I say we turn that low protein into high protein and feed all these billions of people. Uh, this is just some interesting statistics, and I'll try and make a point out of it. But 75% uh, of the world's cattle population is in five countries. I don't know if that's good or bad, 
or what it is, but that's very interesting considering that 200 countries, depending on who's counting, 75% of the world's cattle are in only five of them. But every country in the world either has cattle, eats beef or drinks milk or does all three. Most of them do all three. So we're in a global business. Like we not, no one, is, no one is not in this business and no one is not a, a consumer of our product. Um, the top five countries by cattle inventory, India, 330 million, then Brazil, 220, China, 130, USA, 94, and Argentina, 50. Um, the reason I've got that up is the U.S. is the number one beef producer in the world, like I said, just by making things more efficient. China, I mean, India's still the biggest dairy producer, but that's a, you'd think they would be considering they don't eat beef and they, they only milk cows, but it's a very interesting system. Most producers have only got two or three cows, so it's a, a very unique uh, scenario that they have there. I guess the, the gist of this is that that every country in the world is doing what we do. Um, Again, this is the toolbox that we've been speaking about right through the day in terms of balancing it. And I've mentioned this before, making use of phenotype, making use of EBVs and EPDs and genomics in herd indexes and pedigree. Uh, and, and what's the most important one? Depends what you're doing at that time. These are all incredibly important uh, tools that need to all be utilized. And uh, if you're gonna drive a nail, use a hammer, you know, not a screwdriver. So to use appropriate tools for, for what the objective is that we're trying to do. Body parts of a bull and female, I'm not gonna go through. You guys, th this, is a, this is a 101 course. You guys are, are masters and PhD guys, so we're not going on that. Um, these are just some images. We're going to do a practical later where we're gonna go through some cattle, but these are just some obvious images. I said cattle need to eat, walk, and reproduce. As you see the limousin bull on the right, is incredibly straight through his shoulder and hind leg, and he's got small testicles, so the, the, the walk and reproduce side of that bull is gonna be very challenged. The bull on the left, the red Angus bull, as you can see, he's got a lot more angle on his joints, good testicle size and shape, so he's gonna fulfill that role uh, a lot better. Udder quality, uh, this is a very important trait in both beef and dairy. We want udders that last because when a, when a cow's udder falls apart or udder floor collapses, that's a, normally a very good time to cull that cow. So we want udders that are tightly suspended, a good level udder floor, nice full udder that blends into that body wall, good teat size, not too short, not too long, uh, like the Goldilocks story, not too hot, not too cold, right in the middle. That's the theme for the day, uh, is, is, to, is to be like Goldilocks likes it. Um, and then you see on the right, there's a cow that's rare udder has collapsed. That cow's not gonna be able to work in the herd much longer. So to keep these cattle um, feasible and, and operating within uh, an, an efficient, profitable herd, we need to get these udders uh, level and tight and tightly suspended. Um, what's in the head? And I think this is where Brad, the Canadians, are way ahead of the Americans in paying attention to skull shape and, and head quality. I know in Namibia and South Africa, there's a lot of emphasis put on heads and that's for good reason, because it really tells the whole story. I've never seen a good bull with a bad head and the same with a cow. Like you take this, the bull on the left, the New Zealand Angus bull, it's got a broad muzzle and a strong jaw. Uh, the width of an animal's muzzle is the same as the width between his pin bones. So you'd see a, an animal with a wide muzzle, you know there's thickness right through the animal, that strong jaw is essential for foraging. Width between the animal's eyes uh, will tell you a lot about that animal. It'll tell you that he's earlier maturing. If he's got a shorter head, uh, that, that deep eye set's gonna be a better temperamented animal as well. The longer the head, the later maturing, the more growth the animal's got when it comes into mature size. So just keeping it in balance, and then also an animal with that prominent neck vein and crest, you know he's masculine, uh, so his secondary um, sexual traits are really, really strong. And 
he's going to be an easy fleshing type of animal too when you look at that skull shape, uh, which means that he's going to have a tender carcass when it comes to consumption one day. The bull on the right, long narrow skull, small little eye at the top of the head, small jaw. So the tendency here is going to be to have a smaller testicles, less fertile, a small eye high up in the head. If you guys have worked with horses, what's the wildest horse in the pen? The one with the small eye right up at the top. So you, you want some width between the eyes and a soft, uh, well-set eye. He hasn't got much jaw on him either, so there's not going to be much thickness in this animal. And that tighter throat, and this is especially important for countries like Namibia or Texas where I am, we have to have some skin on these cattle because the more hide they have, the more uh, uh, sweat glands they've got, so their internal cooling system can work a lot better. When we tighten these hides up too much, we lose their uh, adaptability and their heat tolerance. Uh, again, this is that's below you guys, but foot and leg structure, you see the Red Bull at the top, we want big square feet with evenly sized toes and a lot of heel depth. Uh, no structure works without a foundation. So we've got to get these foundations on these cattle. You don't want those toes too wide apart so that stones and mud can get stuck in there and not too close either. You want balance when it comes to foot quality. Uh, the Hereford bull on the right, that's in southern Alabama. That bull's not adapted to the environment and the way you can tell is how low his scrotum is hanging. Uh, the way that bulls regulate the, the temperature of their testicles to keep those sperm alive is by lengthening the neck of the scrotum. So the bull on the left, the Brangus bull, you can see he's got a nicely suspended uh, testicles. And so he's adapted to, to his environment. And often when you see tropical degenerates like that Hereford bull there, the first thing you notice is that they, they drop their scrotum so low because they've had to do that to regulate, uh, to regulate temper uh, temperature. And also it becomes a hazard when it comes to injury uh, etc. Especially in a country like Namibia with a lot of bush. So you want that scrotum hanging uh, above the hocks, especially in the younger, the younger years of a, of, a, of a bull's life. Very nice practical sheath on that bull too. As you can see, nice angle on the sheath, small prepuce opening, uh, not pendulous at all. Uh, with these Bos indicus influence cattle, like we'll see with a Simbra, we don't want to tighten that hide up too much either because we lose that heat tolerance. Some, some skin also create some hardiness and softness uh, to go with it as well. Uh, feminine wedge shape, you'll see the Wagyu cow on the left is very dominant in her forequarter and her chest and she gets tight in her flank. So she's got a, a, a reverse balance when it comes to uh, the, the way she's operate, uh, the, the way her hormones are functioning. Her, uh, her testosterone estrogen level won't be the right way around. And I think with her, it's because she's been flushed a lot. You can see her tail head is quite prominent. So she's, she's probably artificially driven that way, but that's, that shows you a cow that's out of balance. The Angus cow on the right, beautifully balanced cow, as you can see, she pr gets progressively deeper as you get uh, into, into her hindquarter. Deep rib shape, soft flank, and still very maternal uh, and smooth through her shoulder and her neck. Maternal and terminal body types. Now in our industry, we need both kinds. We need the maternal cattle that become the cows that raise the calves and the terminal cattle that you can use for growth and muscle uh, if you're in a, in a terminal breeding program and these cattle feed out very well in, in feedlots. You, you'll see a softer type of muscling in the Hereford bull, a deeper body. Um, that, that muscle shape is more maternal. When you get your, your, your tighter, harder, deeper, more um, prominent muscle that's got that uh, muscle tone to it. Those become your more terminal cattle, and you'll see a correlation there too between body type in terms of fat cover, but also the sexual organs tend to get smaller when you get onto your more terminal cattle for obvious reasons. Um, uh, temperament is incredibly important, and around the world, no matter where you go, it's becoming harder and harder to get good workforces and good help. Uh, a lot of farmers around the world are getting older, so we need to keep uh, focused on, on temperament, and it's a, it is a profit trait. So none of us need what that, that car on the right is doing, and we need a lot more of what this car on the, on the left is doing. Also, uh, there's some studies coming out of Washington State University showing 
that bad temperament and subfertility are, are very highly correlated. So there's another reason to send all your wild cows to town. This is, this is a science that uh, was developed in the 50s and 60s by Professor Jan Bonsma when he was at Texas A&M University on hide color and its effects on infrared and ultraviolet rays. And the, the gist of it was that uh, all these different coat colored cattle do work depending on what environment they're in. So the silver gray colored cattle uh, or the straw colored honey colored cattle, these cattle work really well uh, at low to mid altitude. They work really well when the infrared rays uh, are intense. And if you take a look going back to India again, all those Indian breeds in the really hot tropical parts of India were this color. Uh, Red works very well in savannah, also where there's uh, mid to high, uh, high-ish altitude. Um, with strong infrared, red is a, a color that's certainly preferable to black in that environment. Where black comes into its own is uh, when the average temperature of the, of the location is 65 degrees Fahrenheit or less, which is, what is that in Celsius, Brad? <laughs> Um, 65 would be around 15. So if your average temperature throughout the year is 15 degrees Celsius, black uh, it becomes the color of choice. And also at any altitude, black handles altitude a lot better because the ultraviolet is so strong and black can actually make use of that ultraviolet. So one of the tests that he did, which was very interesting, was comparing the body uh, temperature on a red animal and a black animal uh, at midday in July in Texas, which is the hottest month of the year, and there was a 30 degree Fahrenheit difference, so say a 15 degrees Celsius difference between those two animals. Now, if you think how much energy it's going to take to stay cool for that black animal, it's taking away from its ability uh, to reproduce, to grow, and to perform like it needs to. So I think it's also important when it comes to adaptability that uh, we choose wisely what colored cattle we use. Black is also very good in heavy forested areas um, where little sunlight gets through, black absorbs the, the, the rays that do get through there very, very well. Hair coats in summer and winter. Um, there's a, a cow in summer. As you can see, she's slick. Your, your most fertile heifers are always going to slick off first through the summer. Um, as the days start getting longer and that paturity gland starts working, the first thing it does is start shedding the coats. So when you look at your young heifers, your replacement heifers, the ones that hold their hair the longest are usually your subfertile ones that are going to be problematic breeders in the future. And Namibia gets as cold as most places in the world too, so in winter, a lot of places in Namibia, you do want them to grow a good hair coat. And what, what uh, grows hair more than anything is, is, is daylight hours, so that as your days get shorter, uh, and there's, there's more night, you, you get that, that really good hair growth. This is one reason, going back to Canada, why Canadian cattle actually do well in the tropics, is because of how long their days are in summer. Those cattle have, have been bred to be really slick in summer, and then in winter it's the opposite, where they grow those really thick coats. So there's certain lines of Canadian and, and North American cattle that actually do work well in the tropics for that reason. And then you get to where it's a little more temperate, so Oklahoma, North Texas, where there's not too much difference between day and night, and those cattle don't shed as well as the, as the Canadian cattle do, which is very interesting. So what makes hair shed more than anything is daylight hours, not heat or cold. Um, like you'd, you'll take countries like New Zealand where it, it, it never really gets too hot or too cold. Those cattle have hair most of the year uh, because it's so windy and it rains so much. So... If you want to grow hair, wind and rain. If you want to slick hair, long days. Pigmentation, um, I think this is another thing that Southern Africans do as well as anyone is putting pigment on these cattle. Uh, pigment is essential because of the infrared and the ultraviolet rays. The stress on white skin is hazardous. Um, the amount of energy that animals lose in trying to get comfortable when, when ultraviolet and infrared is hitting the white parts of a body uh, it's essential on, on the eyelids, on the sexual organs to get that pigmentation on them. And the other thing is we have poisonous plants in southern Africa where what it, it'll cause uh, photosensitivity when those animals consume those plants. And the, the cattle that, that, that 
don't recover from that, those poisonous plants more often than not are the ones that don't have pigmentation. The ones that are well pigmented seem to get through it, uh, you know, despite the fact that there might not be shade. Uh, so there's just two examples on the left. We've got that well pigmented bull and on the right a European dairy simmental bull with, with poor pigmentation. So it all correlates. These things all work together and they fit together. And, and it's not just the phenotype of an animal, but it's the ecosystem of a farming enterprise too. We, we need to preserve our way of life. Like we have to preserve producing cattle the way we do because it's actually for a noble cause. We're giving high, high quality protein to a lot of people. We have to make these animals more productive. Doing that makes us as producers more profitable and it makes our communities and the towns around, around us more prosperous. So we're not wasting our time here. This is actually very, very important. And again, it's all about balance, except that black cow, she's lost her head, so she's not very well balanced. But the other, the two bulls, so limousine bull, beef master bull, Angus cow, tremendous balance on these animals, and they're not extreme in any way. You know, these aren't the biggest or the thickest or the longest animals you're going to find, but everything is working well and, uh, and in proportion. If there are any questions now or while we're working through the animals this afternoon, I'd, I'd love to, to engage. And uh, my caveat to all of this is, I remember I was in, uh, in, it was in Estonia, and a professor said to me after my talk, he said, yes, but that's only your opinion. And I thought that's the most amazing thing anyone's ever said to me. Of course it's only my opinion. I can't give you someone else's opinion. <laughs> it's mine. You know, that's all I've got. So you guys... I'm positive they're, they're better ideas than what I've shared here, but that's what I, that's, that's all I have. That's been my observation from, from traveling around the world. Um, I look forward to chatting to you guys and engaging for the afternoon. Thank you very much.